Uh, I'm Mike Hammer. I work for AG Interactive, which is the online subsidiary of American Greetings. What's that? You're pulling your ear back there? Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll speak a little bit yeah, louder. The fans just started up. Okay. So, uh, I've been dealing with security and uh, messaging at AG oh, for a little over 12 years now. And before that, uh, I was dealing with it at other companies. And I've been involved in writing some of the standards uh, in the email authentication space. And I'm one of the folks who have brought you DMARC. And I think we're cutting off the edge of the slide. Let me see if I can do a control L. Control L. Let's see. There we go. Okay. So uh, how many of you have actually heard of DMARC other than the promotion for this talk? Anybody? Yeah, it's gotten an, an amazing amount of media coverage. We were really surprised. Um, we'll go to the next uh, one. So uh, DMARC, which is Domain-Based Messaging Authentication Reporting and Conformance, uh, started about 18 months ago. And there were 14 companies that were participating. And, and I'm really pleased that AG was invited to participate. And we were invited because of our uh, active and aggressive stance in this space. And this is really building on what a slightly larger group of companies have been doing privately. The problem is that the private peering in this didn't scale very well. And so we started talking about how can we make this a standard that anybody can participate in. And um, this, in some respects, this is a very incremental step. In other respects, it's really revolutionary. So when we look at phishing and other forms of messaging abuse, uh, roughly about 90% of mail is abusive. This is based on, uh, Maud puts out a report where many mailbox providers do data feeds on this and other companies in the space, uh, AV vendors and whatnot, put out numbers. Um, the government has problems with it, and it's a real problem. So we came out, we, the community, came out with SPF and DKIM. Uh, both of these standards came out initially about the same time. So SPF first came out about 2003, 2004, um, DKIM started getting talked about at that time. Yahoo had come out with uh, domain keys a couple years before, and there were problems and limitations. And it took a while for these to get traction. Um, but as you can see today, um, a lot of mail streams are covered. I mean, it's amazing. So by volume, over 75%, of mail is protected by SPF records. Unfortunately, many of those records are incorrect or not very strong. Um, and as you can see, DCAM is over 50%. And when you implement DMARC, you really want to be using both of these. And you need to be using them in very specific ways. How's that for confusing slides? Very specific. Yeah. So basically what this is showing is that email authentication is really hard if you're not doing it consistently and you're not doing it right. And so the receivers are trying to figure out what's real and what's not. And how do I trust senders when they publish records because so many of them get it wrong? And as you can see from the receivers, um, if senders aren't implementing email authentication consistently, how can receivers act on it? And remember, they're the ones that when they get it wrong, they get the calls from their customers saying, what the hell did you do with my mail? Right? Why'd you throw it away? Why'd you put it in the spam folder? 
So the solution is really authenticate all of your mail everywhere. But the problem with that is it takes a lot of effort and work. I like to tell a joke. How many psychiatrists does it take to change a light bulb? And the answer is, hey, you, way in the back, what's the answer? One, the light bulb has to want to change. Exactly. <laughs> and the problem is, people don't want to change how they do mail. This is a problem, for example, with mailing list operators. They say, we've been doing mail for 30 years. Who the hell are you to say we have to change how we do what we do? My response is, you don't have to change what you do, but accept the fact that if I'm trying to protect people from my domains being abused by bad guys, your mail is going to break if somebody sends mail claiming to be from my domain and it's not originating from my IPs and it's not DKIM signed by me. Okay, so is everybody pretty familiar with SPF and DKIM? Yes, no? Raise your hand if you're not. Okay, so real quickly, SPF is path-based, okay? If you do a lookup of an SPF record, they're in DNS, um, it's basically going to say something, and I'll show an example. It's going to say something like um, these records, IP addresses, it could be an A record or an MX record, um, are authorized to send mail on my behalf. DKIM is message-based, and it's a, basically a white crypto signing of the message, so that you can go back again to DNS. It's a private key, public key. You can validate whether or not it was legitimately signed, the signature is valid, and it covers the entire body of the message as well as the headers. Those two combined are really powerful, particularly when you have first-party signing of DKIM coupled with SPF. Remember, you have to control the DNS in order to publish the records. That's how the mailbox provider, the recipient, knows how to validate and that it really is from you. Now, if somebody breaks in to your DNS server or does um, some DNS hijacking, they can put out records, obviously, that are fake. And that's why you get into things like you should be doing DNSSEC to protect your DNS records, things like that. So in any event, with the two red boxes there, basically what it's saying is the from, that's the visible from in an email message that you get, needs to match the mail from, which is at the transport layer of SMTP, okay? And this is something that has not been required before. And if you are not doing DMARC, you don't have to worry about this stuff. On the other hand, uh, your mail is not being protected by this sort of approach. Okay, so this is a, and by the way, uh, this uh, PDF is available on the DMARC.org site. I decided to use it precisely because it is publicly available and you can go and download it and look at it yourself and review it. Okay, so this is just showing what happens with mail at a very high level, right? Somebody composes the mail, they send it through their mail server, which hopefully is signing with DKIM. It goes out the MTA, gets to the receiving MTA, and we start doing some validation. And there's the standard validation tests that everybody's been doing for a long time, uh, real-time block lists, reputation, that sort of stuff. Um, and then you have uh, validating the DKIM, checking the SPF record, and now we can check the DMARC policy. So DMARC is policy that is layered on top of these other schemes, right? And what DMARC allows you to do is the first thing, as a sender, you can get a report from mailbox providers. This is huge. If, if we got nothing else from DMARC, this is a huge win. Why? Because in the past, 
there was no public way, there was no standard way for us as senders to get reporting back from mailbox providers. And so if we went back and we looked at participants, um, Google is supporting this, Yahoo is supporting this, Microsoft is supporting this, AOL is supporting this, Comcast is supporting this. There are other large mailbox providers who were not part of DMARC.org who are also going to be announcing that they are supporting this. So they can send back either an aggregate report and the default is daily, or they can send back individual forensic reports on failures. And I'll get into that a little bit more, but the fact that you can actually see what's happening with your mail and with other mail claiming to be yours is huge. Okay, so there's either it passed or it can go into quarantine or it can be rejected, okay? Um, and then there's, you can see on the right hand side there, the update the periodic aggregate report to be sent to the sender. Okay, so as I mentioned, DKIM and SPF configuration guidelines are required, and this is to get alignment and reduce the risk or mitigate the risk of abusive messaging pretending to be you. There's a DNS uh, DMARC record. And this is real easy. If you want to check if a domain is uh, sending and participating as a sender in DMARC, all you have to do is underscore DMARC dot and then the rest of the domain. So underscore DMARC dot AmericanGreetings.com or underscore DMARC dot Facebook.com. And I'll show you some of those records in a little bit. Uh, the aggregate reporting <coughs> format is a little bit kludgy right now. Not the report itself, that's an XML. But when you get it, you'll get it as a zip file attachment. So it makes parsing and processing a little bit more difficult. The reason for doing it this way, we needed to get the standard out, set, out the door, and we had a problem. For, for large mailing domains, somebody like Facebook that's, I don't know, they're sending about three quarters of a billion or a billion messages a day. The feedback reports were too large if they were unzipped or uncompressed. A lot of mail systems have a 20 or 30 megabyte limit um, and they compress down really nicely. So we're still looking at what to do for the long term, but that was what we came up with for the short term. So let's talk a little bit about the options in the record. So there's the version, right now it's DMARC 1. Um, we're going to be leaving that as DMARC 1 until we get it submitted to the IETF. And that's going to probably take a little bit uh, before we do that. Then you have percent. So that's percentage of messages subject to filtering. So if you put percent equals 20, that means they will act on 20% of the messages, the mailbox provider, and quarantine them, reject them, whatever it is that you're saying they should do. If you're only in monitor mode, by default, it, it's 100%, right? All they're doing is giving you the reporting back if it's in monitor mode. Um, RUA, that tag is specifying the email address or email addresses that get the aggregate reports. R or RUF is for the forensics reports. I do not recommend that you start by using the rough tag, okay? If you put that in there and it's coming back to your mail systems, the individual reports, if somebody sends a million bad messages to a mailbox provider that is participating, you will get back a million email messages telling you that they failed. So this is a nice way to set yourself up for mail bombing, right? Okay. We actually, and, and I'll digress a little bit, there are two vendors in this space right now, third-party vendors, a company called Agari. Um, it's a startup founded by Pat Peterson, who was, I believe, employee number three at Ironport. Um, he knows this space very well. Um, he left Cisco, because Cisco acquired Ironport, uh, to start Agari because they had technology in this space um, 
that Cisco wasn't moving forward, so it's kind of a spin out from Cisco. The other company is Return Path. I'm sure many of you are familiar with them. Um, and they are also very good. And they have uh, large scale architecture to handle uh, the large volumes of mail that come back in the individual reports. Um, digressing a little bit more, I am speaking with a couple people uh, for doing an open source parsing and presentation capability. Uh, it'll probably be in Python. Um, so that you can do, look at this kind of reporting. Uh, trying to read XML um, gets very tiring very fast, at least for me. Um, so then moving along, we have P. That's the policy for the organizational domain. You have SP, which is the policy for subdomains. Now, if you, the way that it works is um, when validating, they're going to try, the mailbox provider is going to look at the subdomain first, see if there's a record. If not, then they're going to check the organizational domain. So if you specify and have a record in the subdomain, it will just use that. If not, it will go back and check that organizational domain. And you want to be a little bit careful here, particularly if you have third-party mailers, ESPs, whatever, doing newsletters and other stuff for you. Um, because if they don't have alignment right, and you publish a quarantine or reject policy at your organizational domain, so I'll use American Greetings as an example. Uh, if we publish that at AmericanGreetings.com. We use a company called Exact Target for newsletters and whatnot. We delegate a subdomain called email.americangreetings.com to them. So if they got it wrong, whatever they said would be get thrown on the floor. So we have them publish a record right now, independent of our organizational domain. See, you thought this stuff was really simple. Um, you have the ADCAM, which is the alignment. So you can do. By default, alignments are relaxed. If you specify strict for either uh, DCAM or SPF, the domains have to line up exactly. Okay? So if you have a subdomain that you're mailing from, but you're signing with the organizational domain, it will get rejected if you specify a strict policy and you specify reject. Is everybody following along on this stuff? Anybody not following along? Questions? No? Okay. So, um, I mentioned the reporting. A lot of stuff is redacted in the reporting. So, the aggregate reports do not give you delivery disposition. This is something that in these private pairing arrangements, we have been getting told whether stuff is going in the inbox or it's going into the junk folder or it's being rejected. So privately, a little more information, but boy, once you start telling the lawyers we're, we have a public standard and we're feeding back information, um, they get a little bit nervous, right, because of privacy laws, particularly in Europe, Canada has new privacy laws. Um, so uh, you're not going to get delivery disposition, and you are not going to get individual email addresses. So you're going to get it by IP, and you're getting aggregates on those IP addresses as to whether you're getting passes or fails. Um, you're you're going to be told, or it's going to confirm, what the policy action that you requested when they read the record is and what they did as far as conforming to that. And that's really important because if you change your record and they didn't tell you that, how do you know if they got it right? So if you went from monitoring to quarantine or quarantine to reject, right at that transition point, you want to know exactly what was going on. So giving that feedback is really important. And if you, I don't know if you can read it in the back, but there's an example of the uh, XML for that aggregate reporting. 
Everybody good? Okay. Swim lane, I love that term. Okay, so basically this is showing you the back and forth. So the sender's sending an email, the receiver's doing some DNS requests, right? So it's doing it for um, SPF, it's doing it for DKIM, and then it's doing it for DMARC. And it's going to do some evaluation of it. If it doesn't pass, um, it's going to send a failure report to the participating sender. And again, if you're a sender that's not publishing a DMARC record, the mailbox provider, the receiver, is going to try and do that lookup. But if it doesn't find anything, it's going to go, okay, this domain's not participating in DMARC, so I'll just do whatever other checks I normally would have done. Um, and so failure report for the individual if you ask for it, and then the aggregate report. Um, okay. So for outbound authentication, your first steps are going to be try and deploy DKIM and SPF as best as you can. Ensure alignment for the from and the mail from, so for SPF and DKIM. Uh, publish a monitor record that's going to start giving you feedback. I highly recommend a separate uh, mailbox for getting those reports because um, one of the interesting things that's going to happen is more receivers start implementing and validating on this, you're going to start getting reports coming back that you didn't really expect or know about, right? Because it just sort of happens automatically. So if 100 domains start validating tomorrow, you will start getting 100 reports if they're sending those reports. If a thousand do it, you'll start getting a thousand. So keeping that separate in a separate mailbox and processing is probably a good idea. If you're doing those individual reports, I would recommend a separate mail, inbound mail infrastructure so that you don't shoot your toes off. Ask me how I know I shot my toes off. <laughs> um, so yeah, learn from the data, gain confidence, and then you can move from monitor to quarantine and ultimately to reject. And this is really powerful stuff. Um, let's see. Eh, this is all sort of PR kind of stuff. It gets it mostly right. Um, and one of the problems that we've had, so we, we announced publicly on the 30th, and to date, there's been over a thousand articles in major media. Um, there's been dozens and dozens, I don't have an exact count, of um, television news segments on it. There's been radio segments. I don't know how many, but I know NPR did one that they repeated a number of times. Um, and then if you go and you just look on the web and do a search, blog posts and everything else, in like two weeks, it's almost 400,000 entries that you get returned. I mean, so there's been a lot of interest in this, and there's been some hype, and there's been some over-promising. Um, it's hard to separate the very narrow technical <coughs> things that DMARC does, and does very, very well, uh, from some of the over-promising that, that happens. So read the specification. There is a list called dmark-discuss that you can sign up for at dmark.org. You can ask questions about the standard itself. If you have some questions about your implementation and what you're seeing, you can ask there. Um, and you're getting access to a lot of very, very experienced people uh, who are participants in dmark.org itself. Um, that you normally would not have access to. So if you're interested in mail, messaging authentication, stuff like that, um, this is a really good thing for you. Okay, now I'm going to show you a couple other things. Well, first, does anybody have any questions at this point? Do you have any problems yet with your third-party email senders changing where they're sending the email from and not telling you? Because I've seen that in a couple companies I've worked for. We have not, but um, we have spent an awful lot of time, and, and they still don't have it 100% correct, which is why their records say monitor mode. 
Um, but they are working to get it exactly correct so that they can publish a reject record as well. Um, but no, they're not switching willy-nilly. Um, and if they do, um, I've got a couple of people who will beat up on them. Sitting right over there. Yeah, go ahead. One of the other problems we've had is <coughs> an employee will be at home, they'll do something with the travel agency, for example. They'll say, send me the uh, reservations where you want it sent. And it lets them fill in their from address. So they naturally fill in their from address as their work address and their two addresses to where they want it to go. And it never gets there because it's basically a forged email. Does this have any protections against them doing things like that? So what you're asking, and I'm going to be a little politically incorrect, what you're asking is, are there protections against stupidity? The answer is no. <laughs> I mean, uh, you have to educate people, right? So there's internal education um, as to what's acceptable and what's not using a corporate domain. The other thing is, if you separate your brand domain from the domain that your employees use, um, you might have different uh, DMARC records and take slightly different approaches. So in the case of American Greetings, um, we don't have, uh, except for a handful directly supporting the site, any end user accounts at AmericanGreetings.com. There's a totally separate domain that we use for our enterprise. And I'd love to see us get to DMARC reject for that as well. But you're, you're right, it is a little more difficult. And there's the mailing list issue, stuff like that. Um, the other thing, uh, it, you know, and PayPal does the same thing. So if you deal with PayPal, any of their official notifications come from PayPal.com. Anything that is an employee email will come from PayPal-Inc.com. Okay, so they've, they've run into some of the issues that you're talking about, and it's just, it's something that has to be dealt with. Any other questions so far? Okay, so let's move on, and this may not be Okay, so that's not, can everybody kind of see that at a gross level? So I'll, I'll walk you through it. I'm over here. So basically, uh, this is real data, and I'm going to show you another slide. So this slide is for one domain, I, I can't tell you which one. Um, and it's showing for two mailbox providers that are taking advantage of DMARC like assertions privately. So this isn't through public assertions, but the assertions are, are almost exactly the same as you would see in a standard public DMARC assertion. And that big spike there, it's all abuse of mail. So this was an attack, and in this case it was over 250,000 emails, and it was 250,000 emails that were rejected by this mailbox provider, a very large one. Uh, that never got to the inbox. They were just rejected. They didn't go into quarantine. They were just thrown away. Um, if you look at these other ones, they had a very slight bump. There was some mailing to a second mailbox provider. They also threw it away. Okay? And if you look at these numbers up here, what they're doing is, so this is uh, mailbox provider one, fail, fail, claims. So those are ones that came from IP addresses that are ours. This is mailbox provider one, none fail. So there was no DKIM record, but it failed SPF. And from our claimed IPs, this is mailbox provider one, fail, fail, unclaimed. So these are IPs that are not ours. Mailbox provider one, none fail, unclaimed. So these are no DKIM record, failed SPF, and they're not our IPs. And same thing for mailbox provider two. Okay. So what this shows is it works. It works for what it was designed to work for. And if you have control of your mail flows, 
there is actually very little risk of legitimate mail getting thrown away. And I have to emphasize again, if you have control of your mail flows. And that's not just when you set it up, it's an ongoing thing, right? So if somebody breaks your DNS, that DNS record, or they change it accidentally, you have a problem. And it doesn't matter whether it's the DMARC record, the SPF record, or the DKIM record. Okay. So, any questions on this? Anybody confused about it? Okay. So, this is very similar. This is a different domain, two different mailbox providers, and we see something very similar. So, when you look at these ones where it's claimed, right, they don't even move off of that baseline there. But again, here's almost 70,000 emails, malicious emails, that were just thrown away. The mailbox provider didn't have to do any other checks. All they had to do was check whether it authenticated, whether the authentication was aligned, and did it fail. So this is a lot more lightweight than some of the other things that you have to do for anti-spam and anti-phishing um, to figure out. So lastly, I just wanted to throw up, and I did this real quick before I came over. Uh, is that big enough for folks, or do I need to make it bigger? Big enough? Yes? Okay, so these are actual DMARC records, and I've given an example of each. So the first one is actually for AmericanGreetings.com, and you can see the version. You can see the P equals none, so we're not asserting a policy. We're in monitor mode. We've got the percent equals 100. We don't really need that if we're in a monitor mode, but I've got it in there just because we've done it across a bunch of domains, and when I change it, um, this just makes it a little bit easier. And so you can see for the RUA, it's the aggregate reporting, we've got it coming back to us. We also have it going to Agari. For the RUF, which is the individual forensics reports, we have it going to Agari and they do a lot of processing and we just look at the results nicely done on their portal um, for us to figure out. So the next record is from LinkedIn, and you see it's very similar. They're also using Agari, that auth, auth metrics. Um, Agari was called Authentication Metrics, and recently, several months ago, changed their name to Agari. So both, both of those addresses work. And you can see LinkedIn is publishing Quarantine. They are looking to get to reject fairly soon. And if we look at Facebook, and I, I have to give kudos to Facebook, um, and particularly Mike Atkins there. Um, Mike went there from AOL well, about a year ago, and he has just been incredibly aggressive um, in implementing various uh, security measures to protect people. Um, so you can see they've got P equals reject, and um, it's just working really nicely for them. I wish, and I tried, because um, there's been data sharing within dmark.org. Um, imagine, if you will, a slide similar to what I showed you with uh, the data, um, but from a major receiver's point of view, they are throwing away hundreds of millions of malicious emails a day. Okay, It's not visible, it's not public. But this, this is huge. Right now, um, with the commitments, because not all of the participants have implemented yet, some like ourselves. So I wanted to implement. We released the standard on the 30th. Um, we were doing tweaks up to the week before it was released publicly. And uh, Valentine's 
that's two of our biggest days of the year, so I really didn't want to mess with stuff. I'm going to go back afterwards, and we'll be moving through quarantine to reject fairly quickly. Um, and from our perspective, we're not just protecting our customers. The people most likely to fall for abusive mail, phishing, pretending to be our brands, are not our customers. It's the people our customers send mail to or the people who have never dealt with us before because everybody wants to be loved. Um, so having said that, I'm going to wrap up with DMARG does something very well. It prevents abuse of domains that you own, that is direct abuse. It does not deal with cousin domains. It does not deal with abuse within the display or pretty name in the from field uh, when you look at an email message. Um, and you can blame Dave Crocker who wrote the original RFC 822 for that. And I beat him up every time I see him. Um, they just didn't think about security back in the 1970s the way that we do today. Right? Um, so there's lots of things DMARC doesn't do. There are a few things that it does very well. So I recommend that if you are a sender, start publishing those monitor records, getting those aggregate reports. A lot of people who are already doing it, um, who just published them in the last couple weeks since it's been announced, are going, wow, I never realized that that abuse was going on, that people were sending claiming to be me. Um, the other thing, so that wasn't the last thing to wrap up. The other thing that's really neat about those forensics reports is, so a lot of stuff is redacted. Basically, you're going to get the headers, and they'll redact email addresses, and you're going to get links that were within the body of the message. And so I've been doing some experimenting, and what I have found is if we remove the links that we know belong to us or should be in the mails that we send, basically everything that is left is malicious. And so I'm starting to work with several companies to take those links, do exactly what I just described, and then pass those malicious links or possibly malicious links to companies that feed into the block lists for the various browsers. So for IE, for Chrome, for Firefox. And my goal, if, I, if everything works well, is to take the cycle time where it takes us two days to do a site takedown down to about 15 minutes to get it blocked. Because from my perspective, if I can prevent the end user from getting to it, it's just as good as if I had taken it down. Still got to do the takedowns, but the window of potential maliciousness is significantly reduced. How you expand that from known trusted people or organizations to everybody feeding in, I don't know. Um, I do know that folks like BITS, um, which is uh, the large financials and FSISAC, which is the financial services ISAC, are looking at these sorts of things. Um, they found this very interesting. So we're moving it forward. We are starting to look at some of the other issues like the display name, cousin domains, and trying to figure out how we can leverage what we're doing here into those spaces as well. So with that, I'm going to shut up unless you have questions. SDF in order for it to work, the receiving company had to actually do the DNS lookup and then decide to enforce it. And it was really slow getting any type of traction on that. What what MTAs are you aware of have DMARC capabilities built into them? And which major ISPs are actually checking their emails that comes in? So right now, the only two that are checking are Google and Yahoo. Microsoft uh, that is Hotmail will be coming online. They're also having discussions, but this is going to be a much longer cycle time for Exchange. 
I do know that the folks at SendMail are working on implementing, and in fact, um, uh, uh, Marie uh, Kachuri, who used to be at SendMail, he's now with CloudMark, um, he is actually working on a plug-in slash milter for SendMail. I do know that Message Systems is working to implement for both outbound and inbound, as well as other MTA vendors, Port 25, um, and others. So uh, because a lot of the vendors were not participants, they didn't have the standard until the 30th. So they are working on it. There's a lot of interest. Um, next week at MOG, the Messaging Anti-Abuse Working Group, we, we're doing a session, um, actually two. One is a panel with DMARC.org members uh, talking about what we've seen. There will be a little more detail than what I'm presenting tonight um, because MOG is an organization, is a signatory to the NDA, um, and we've been giving them some information. Same thing with bits. Um, so it's going to happen. It's just going to take a little bit of time. Make sense? Any other questions? Anybody excited about this? No? <laughs> yes. Oh, okay, I feel better. Okay, well, thank you.